Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. We are delighted to welcome you to today's session, Harnessing Error Reporting, Unleashing the Power of Quality and Speed. I am your host, Ashton Dixon Pemberton. I'm a Senior Marketing Manager at Source. I'm joined today by my esteemed presenter, Marcus Merrill, VP of Technology at Source Labs. For those of you that have been with us throughout the summit, he will be a familiar face. And for those of you that are new, be a new face. It is now my pleasure to hand over to today's presenter, Marcus Merrill. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcus Merrill. I'm the Vice President of Technology Strategy here at Sauce Labs. And um, today we're going to be talking, ironically, about harnessing error reporting, about unleashing the quality, power of quality and speed. And so uh, we're going to start with uh, sort of, um, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you who I am. Then we'll talk a little bit about what error reporting means. And then we'll talk about how it fits into the software development lifecycle. And then we'll talk about sort of how, how does it fit into the world of testing? How does it join up with the rest of the platform that Sauce Labs has? And then we'll talk about the actual offering that we're here to, uh, to show you today. Uh, we'll wrap up a little bit of Q and A for which I have some amazing assistance from uh, Davey O'Donnell, O'Donnell uh, who uh, works on the, uh, the error crash reporting team. And uh, we'll wrap it up. Without further ado, let's talk a little bit about the, the cost of low quality software. Um, I'm betting that every single person who can hopefully hear my voice um, has experienced some issues with some software not just in the last five minutes. I mean, like, uh, I, let, let's sound off in the chat. When was the last time you were sort of enraged or angered or, or annoyed by uh, the performance of, say, a mobile app? My bet is it was sometime in the last 24 hours. Probably, probably a uh, safe bet, I think, considering uh, the, the way things have gone uh, lately with, uh, with apps, with games, with... Uh, Anything that you can name, anything, any kind of software that you're trying to use. If you're trying to book a flight, you're trying to board a flight, you're trying to, uh, you know, play a game or or deal with an insurance issue. Or uh, one thing I've been doing a lot lately, believe it or not, is uh, all trails and uh, doing a lot of hiking. And the app is great, uh, but the interaction with some of the other uh, apps inside the, the software is lacking. And I don't know if it's because of the one or the the one that are in, interacting with. Um, bottom line is that customers tend to churn pretty quick when they can, when your, when your app doesn't work after just like two negative experiences, they'll abandon your, your app if they can. And I think it's important also to discuss that the fact that, um, sometimes people can't abandon your app. Sometimes it's a matter of brand opinion. Sometimes it's a matter of, you know, can someone leave? You? Like, if you work for an insurance company and insurance is tied to employer, then you really can't leave the app. But your trust with that brand when you go to your next or when you when you sign up for some sort of health plan that might involve this company, you're going to have possibly a negative opinion of that brand, which uh, can't help. Uh, if if you're in this state and you're unhappy with the brand, you're less likely to purchase from an under a performing platform when you do uh, find yourself needing to uh, to work with that brand once again. I feel like everyone can understand this instinctively, but we've run some surveys. We, we've uh, we've put out a report recently that shows just how serious this is. Um, so low quality software leads to abandonment, leads to uh, low lower revenue, leads to people, you know, undeleting or uh, deleting the app at the moment the moment they run into any sort of trouble. Unfortunately, with some some brands and some apps, we're stuck with them, but we still end up with kind of a low opinion. And that can lead to some, you know, some bad things. Um, what we find is that 25% uh, of customers who've had a bad brand experience will not come back. You lose them forever. And if you're in the kind of business where you rely on having kind of a low touch platform, but you need to make your app sticky so that people will voluntarily come back, then you find that user experience is the top concern you've got. So what we find is, is uh, in app reviews, 
as as you probably all know, stars cost you money. If you go from five stars to four stars, there's some crazy percentage of of uh, cr- crazy percentage of users who will not come back to uh, they'll uninstall. There's a crazy amount of revenue associated with losing wow. one or two stars. So what we've done is we've done some a- analysis is uh, of uh, the different stars that, that people give, the different reviews people give. Uh, it's kind of phrases that we find them find find in the uh, you know in the reviews themselves in the body of the text, and we see these these recurring themes, things like every time and keeps crashing and please fix and doesn't work. And what this is indicative of is not that one person is experiencing a problem, but that huge swaths of user bases are experiencing problems consistently over and over. And they're dying to abandon the brand and either they can't or they have already and your next users are going to come along and do the same thing. So it's, it's, it's shocking. I I actually learned recently that uh, also that two star reviews are much more effective at getting uh, feedback or getting, getting action from the app maker than one star reviews. One star review appears like a, a rage quit, but if you actually want the company to pay attention to what's going on inside your review, give it two stars. Because it doesn't look like so much rage. It actually looks like someone who's put some thought into, into their opinion of the app. And they're going to actually say something that's, uh, that's worth, uh, worth listening to. So that's just an aside. But I, I, just, I think the, the point is that there's a lot of people suffering a lot under a lot of bad software right now. And at the same time, we're seeing QA teams, test teams get cut. They get, you know, people are getting removed from their, from their positions, even though this problem is running more rampant than perhaps it ever has. Uh, like I said, once again, uh, pretty much everyone in the crowd right now is probably aware of such an experience and has probably experienced it in the last 24 hours. Um, I think my count in the last 24 hours is running at half a dozen different apps that have, uh, you know, caused some annoyance. <clears throat> The most frequent and impactful complaint types. Functional error, app crashing, network problem, not UX, not user experience, not the functional aspect of how someone experiences your app and experiences a smooth transition or or even delight. Most of it's not privacy or, or ethical complaints. The issues are functional errors, app crashing, network problem, compatibility, unresponsive, resource heavy. And these are things that are difficult for a user to understand. They all usually, usually hover around the same kinds of root causes that we see, especially functional error, act crashing, network problem. They tend to cause the same kinds of symptoms for the user. So you can have the best designers in the world, have your requirements mapped out beautifully. You can write the best code uh, for the user interface. You can do amazing testing, exploratory manual testing for your app. But if the back end is not handling things properly in combination with the client side's uh, code, then your users are going to have a bad time and they're not going to have a whole lot of patience. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got <clears throat> something here. Software quality is your business foundation. And I think everyone on the call knows this. Everyone understands that. But what we're showing today is we're trying to shed light on the part of the iceberg that's starting to be a little bit below water because um, we are trying as an industry to shift left, which essentially usually means that the bottleneck is simply going to move to the left. But as we, as we work through trying to, to, to smooth everything out, we're trying to go through continuous testing. We're trying to, to achieve a point where testing isn't a bottleneck. It's not something you even notice. It's like the referees in a football game. You want to, you want to smooth out the process. You want to, to, to continue in a way that people don't even, don't even know that you're there. However, the problem is that when it, a testing team is just as much at risk when they do a fantastic job as when they do a bad job, because when they do a fantastic job, nobody notices they're there and people assume then that they're, do, that they're not necessary. If they're doing a bad job, Stuff goes out the door all the time. The company manages to survive anyway. And so they're going to assume that the QA team is not necessary. Um, and that is, re- that is resulting in series of, of uh, issues we've seen around the industry 
where people are not able to confidently keep their jobs. <clears throat> the iceberg, this actually, imagine a horizontal iceberg. When you're testing an app and you're in QA, you're a tester, you're a manual tester, even an op, this is a, a React native app or, or a hybrid app, not a mobile app, but the mobile app, the native app is gonna look fairly similar to this. It's gonna, on the left, it's gonna you know, have client side code like uh, uh, you know, what you do at Android Studio or, or Xcode. And normally this is in QA what you've got access to. You can see the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or on a native app, you can see the client side code. You can open Appium, you can see the DOM, you can break the, the interface up into its components. You can see what's going on there. And you can usually see when there's a problem. It'll show you, uh, it'll be responsive, it will be unresponsive. Appium is able to tell you something happened or didn't happen. Um, you can inspect certain items. You can look at what's going on. But it takes extra tooling in order to be able to see what's going on right below the surface. What you usually need to do is instrument the code, uh, ship an extra SDK, and then have some other, uh, some other tool that does monitoring to actually watch what's going on underneath. Or you have to hook up the device to Android Studio or Xcode in order to be able to see the device logs and the telemetry going on in, underneath and battery usage and cell connectivity, all that stuff. But most of the time, testers only have access to this. Now, what developers, developers see everything because they're able to get into Android Studio. They're able to see stack traces and log files and hard files and everything that they need in order to diagnose a problem. They're able to understand how the front end is talking to the back end and debug things when they need to. What we're trying to get into is, uh, oh, a poll question. Uh, poll question, do we have, I assume Ashton is going to put up a poll question right here. Oh, I was asked a poll question. Let me go ahead and ask it and answer it. Okay, great. It's really interesting. I'm curious to see what we see because I think that all four of these issues are pretty prevalent, especially among people who do testing. Um, you just don't see the depths of errors. I mean, when I was in QA, I was in QA for, 20 years or so. And um, what I found was that I was usually able to provide deep, deep uh, insights and, and like almost even get to the root cause, but it, it came at great cost. It was very difficult to get all this data. It wasn't something we could have automatically. It's fascinating how even the split is here. 34% lack of data and depth on errors and crashes to prioritize issues that matter. Long and complicated resolution process to find the root cause of issues. It's the lowest answer, but it's 19% compared to 34%. This is almost an even split. It's fascinating. So this is a very, very relevant need to the people on the call right now. And hopefully we'll show you what could become a superpower to uh, getting help with these issues as you use Sauce Labs. As is reflected in the poll, what we find is uh, the inability to identify risks early in the development lifecycle. I'm gonna pause there for a bit to take on a small tangent around the concept of risk, which I've got a whole other talk track. I think last Tuesday, uh, we gave a webinar with Nikolai Adelodkin where we, we expounded on this a little bit. Um, over the past 20 years of my career, I, I, I've, I've seen a transition in the dev space, in, in, the, in the space around where people write code, and maybe even a little bit in product. I see that just in my experience, and this, your, your mileage may vary, I'd love to hear in the, in the chat if you agree with me. Developers seem to be working more towards the business end of things than QA. That's that's been my experience, that developers are focused on what's going on inside the business, what the requirements are, what the features are. And a lot of times, not every time, a lot of times, QA is focused on minutia, edge cases, things that may not be driving the business forward or protecting or growing revenue as much as they potentially should. And the other thing I've seen is more or less a lack of stark innovation when it comes to tooling around quality assurance. I feel like the most 
significant innovations in the QA testing space over the last 20 years have been uh, around, well, Selenium, uh, Appium. Selenium, the ability to for a tester to be able to robotically control a browser or an app, a, a mobile app, mobile device. But also I've seen, you know, I think visual testing is a very interesting innovation in uh, in testing. But in the dev space, they've done things like, you know, cloud hosting and Kubernetes and Dockerization and containers and fleet management and ephemeral environments and CI CD improvements. And a lot of that innovation hasn't, it's trickled down to the testers. People have figured out how to work it, but it's pretty much on them to do it. What I have not seen so much and what I really think that is this cause of and the solution to our problems is discussion of risk. In my QA career, I wasn't really furthering the company's goals until I started talking about and testing for risk. Risk yeah, Identifying these risks early in the development cycle is is critical to making yourself more relevant in the QA, uh, in the testing career. I mean, at an e-commerce site that I worked for uh, 10-ish years ago, we weren't really considered critical. We were kind of a cost center. We were sort of a, not even really a checkbox because I would say that we wouldn't have even been able to hold up the release if our tests had been failing. What we did was a very conscious effort around prioritizing test cases around the business needs and learning how to test things that the business required in order to be able to protect their revenue and grow it. When we started doing that, when we started looking at things like user analytics and uh, attribution for, for uh, click-throughs and uh, not so much user experience, but things like, is the, is the customer able to complete a cart checkout flow 100% of the time in production? And can we make sure that that is the focus of pretty much 90% of what we do and the other stuff around being able to edit your profile, being able to you know do frivolous things on the app that are fun, but not strictly necessary to revenue. We found that we started testing these things less and less and it just didn't matter. When those things broke, Hardly anyone was using them anyway, so we could just roll back whatever we did and fix it later. Uh, when we focused on what mattered, we were able to keep the engine running always and verifiably so that we could identify these things and, and cover the business. And slowly over a period of time, I'd say uh, less than a year, the QA team was considered indispensable. So... What we're trying to do here by helping you instrument your apps to be able to see crashes and errors is look below the surface of the water, look below the iceberg and help bring these signals to you without you having to go down a whole rabbit hole that it's in, that ends up being a whole career path unto its own. So you could, you could prioritize, you can, get analytics from pre-production errors and crashes rather than having to wait until after you ship. And then stop this painful debugging where you have to call a developer in or hook up Android Studio and learn a whole new tech stack and, and go through a complicated triage process in order to sort of justify why you think this bug is important and worth watching for and illuminate some of the dark corners that are that exist inside your app. Errors and crashes erode trust. Fatal errors are escaping into production and you have sort of, you, you don't get to see it. You, you, you typically in, in the testing profession miss out on an opportunity to catch stuff that's pre-production and wait until it's too late and it's gone to post-production. This leads to a high mean time to rectify, recover. And it also reduces your development speed. It lowers trust between your users and you. Also lowers trust between your testing department and your development department. Your testing department and everyone else. I had a question just last week in a, a live stream. What do you do when you QA for all bugs that get caught in production, out of production, uh, significant, insignificant? And... I just can't believe that we keep asking this question in 2023. 
but I do know, I do recognize that it happens when there's a lack of trust in between these teams and when we just don't have a good sense of, of where, where the team actually can do the most good. It, it occurs to me that um, this is kind of a flippant answer that I would advise people to keep in mind. But if QA gets blamed for all the bugs that make it into production, I think QA should absolutely take ownership of all the bugs that they coded up and put into the application. In other words, none of them. I mean, QA is not blameless, but to think that a QA person who didn't write the bug could be held accountable in exclusively with no thought to other folks that might have been involved. Uh, well, I wouldn't say throw it back on them. I just say it's a team issue. Uh, I will take ownership of all of the bugs that I coded myself, which is zero. Um, sole ownership, rather. So 50% of users will not download it app, rated three stars or fewer. I think uh, people on the call probably know that, but it's worth hearing if you didn't know that. So where are we now? Error reporting in the software development lifecycle. <clears throat> Our responsibility is typically to build, test, debug, and deploy. Now I'm gonna give you a second to, uh, to look over the details on this slide. But this is the world that a lot of us live in. Um, I've lived this, this world, this is what it takes. Test orchestration, massive variability on devices and operating systems. Functional tests are very, very slow when you start to work on, you know, do Appian and uh, native app testing at scale. It's my opinion that a lot of functional UI tests in, in the world right now should probably be con uh, converted over into API tests because the sole function of a, of a UI test should be to demonstrate that the front end, the app or the hybrid app or the web page can render the outputs of you know the server. They can they can show what's going on. They can make sure that the user has a, having a decent experience. A lot of those tests, though, are actually used to test business logic and edge cases. And so you have a test running thirty times to test to make sure that every single error condition is known and everything is done right. But as far as the UI is concerned, you're sort of doing the same kind of exercise over and over and over. Anyway, that's a separate talk track. The point is, testing is hard, testing is slow. And if you're able to get more telemetry out of the tests that you've got early on in pre-production, then I think that being able to, to help out, help the team out with MTTR, being able to fix issues, being able to prioritize things properly, these things are critical. Yet we lack the tooling right now. We need to get a focus on getting these things earlier in the cycle. Here's another poll question. How motivated and interested is your team in improving the current process of handling pre-production patches and reducing bug escape rates in mobile apps? Yeah, and the answers are, uh, you know, highly motivated, interested, neutral, not interested. Uh, and I would say that not interested probably doesn't mean not interested. It means that there's no budget, no, no, uh, you know, no, no realistic ability to get to this kind of thing. Um, my bet is that a lot of folks haven't really been introduced to this topic, at least to the extent that we're talking about it today. And so it'll be interesting to know if people have sort of done any preparation or are able to make any headway on this. And we're fairly evenly split between highly interested and neutral. I always love poll questions that uh, end up with a 100% in, in one category, or in this case, 0% in one category. Out of the 63 people who answered the poll, 0% is not interested. Uh, it reminds me of uh, other fun poll questions that end up like that. Like um, I, I read the statistic once that uh, the number of people who, uh, who, for some reason, hate clowns, 100%. I don't even know if I believe that, but I thought it was funny. Sound off if you like clowns. So how do we test in production? Feature flags, canary builds, root cause analysis. Now, feature flags and canary builds are both tooling processes, 
root cause analysis is still something that requires a human. Now, feature flags are fascinating. And I think that, you know, even though the Sauce Sauce Labs doesn't actually work with feature flags, we have some partnerships in this space, but I think they're kind of magical. And I would love to hear in the chat if you if you agree, if you have some experience with feature flags, I think they're magical, not just because you can turn on and off functionality, but because when you use a feature flag, you have already coded in your rollback mechanism. You already understand how to remove the software from the site and take a feature out that has been put into the world. Um, not even all that long ago, I was involved as the release manager for a major update to uh, an e-commerce website, same when I referenced earlier. And we, we had to roll out a change where we were doing an authentication. Uh, we, were do, we were moving from uh, session cookies with proprietary code that we wrote to JWTs for security in sessions. And I think we had kind of a small concrete company. We had like 13 microsystems that all had to do this at, at the same time. And we orchestrated the rollout. I felt like actually a literal orchestra conductor in that I was saying, team A, switch this on, team B, run a database query, make sure that everything is still okay. Team C, flip the next feature flag. And at some point along the way, something went wrong. It wasn't a big deal. We figured that that uh, we didn't have a problem, but we just turned the feature flag off. Whereas a lot of times when you turn a feature flag on, when you used to deploy software using, you know, doing the hard way, you would have to run a whole bunch of batch scripts and one person would be in charge and would know the process for getting the software out the door, deploying a jar file to a web server or to a fleet, that kind of thing. And if they needed to roll something back, they would have to go through that entire process again with like an older version of the jar file. Uh, feature flags make it to where when you write the, the code, you understand exactly how to turn it off and how to undeploy that code at the time. Canary builds are also important, something that every browser vendor does, uh, where you put out a small a, a small build that people can either adopt optionally, they can take an early advanced copy of the software and you can start to get some signal about whether or not, about how they're testing it. Uh, or you can, you can make it to where uh, a small percentage of your audience sees it. So you can slice in 1% or 2% of traffic. Uh, Android does this a lot when they do a slow roll, they will expand the audience and if anything starts to happen in the first few minutes it's going to happen with two percent of your users and not a hundred percent of your users so you won't suffer an outage you'll suffer a you know a small small interruption for a very few number of, of, of users but very different very different from uh, the days of the entire thing going down and the whole team having to wake up at five in the morning in order to redeploy an older version of the software now root cause analysis is this elusive magic holy grail that has eluded us for a very long time in terms of getting a computer to do it for you. Right now it is coordinating and triangulating between log files and uh, you know crash reports and uh, front end bugs and device logs and har files and microservices, all that sorts of stuff in a huge complicated environment that uh, you know for which how many different APM tools are there out there? I don't know, six million. There's probably one for every person on the call. Um, at least, so we've got uh, New Relic, we've got uh, Sentry, we've got um, uh, Datadog, we've got so many, it's just, it's ludicrous. So, and and I, I would say that most of them don't actually get you to root cause analysis. They just get you the, the information in a very clean, clear way that allows you to do the analysis yourself. So uh, I'm not advertising here that we're doing root cause analysis, but I'm going to show you a couple of tricks that make it surprising that we haven't been able to do this kind of thing before which is gets us to how sauce labs can help so what we have done is in the last few months we have integrated uh the backtrace reporting engine for uh, crashes and error reports that we acquired some three years ago it's an amazing tool it's a brilliant tool it was purpose built for ad tech to be able to capture huge huge swaths of information around how ads are being served up dynamically and data is being gathered. And along the way, we figured out that it was a really, really good use case for massive, the massive volumes of data that you get out of gaming. I don't remember the statistics. Somebody, maybe Delia can help me 
Um, I believe that back trace is now running in 18 of the top 20 AAA games in the world. Uh, if you're thinking about a game that you've been seeing a lot in the media, yes, Backtrace probably supports it. Um, the main killer feature, the main reason that people love it so much is that you're able to deploy a uh, new build. And if uh, Backtrace clients, or sorry, Backtrace SDK is implemented into the client, you know, uh, Xbox or PlayStation or uh, even uh, currently mobile app, you'll get all sorts of information and telemetry out of the users that's combined with the information that's coming out of the backend logs. And it's deduplicated for one thing. So if you deploy, a, you know, 1% of traffic on a game like Call of Duty is going to be in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And if you release something to 1%, it's going to, I might have my math wrong there. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to show up. If you have a problem, huge problem in production, it's going to show up from a lot of users right away, probably as they download or when they, as they move move through the app and they get launched, they, they, they see a crash or they don't see a crash. Anyway, you see it. It gets deduplicated. It gets indexed and symbolicated. It gets translated into a way where the developer can immediately see what's going on inside the app that they've just released to production. Now, uh, we have entire webinars about this. We have a lot of uh, documentation on our website to talk about this, both in relation to gaming and other areas. But what we've done is we have made it now to where when you deploy an app, a, a mobile app to the RDC cloud, uh, sorry, to, to a real device on the Sauce Labs cloud, Android or iOS, we will instrument it automatically with the kinds of SDKs that will make crashes and errors show up. Now, we've had this working in production for a little while now. I can't remember exactly how long. But we've taken some data, some measurements about all of the usage, and this is completely anonymized, so you can't tell whose it is. But we've seen that these tre this trend line here is the number of crashes we've seen in apps running on our mobile device cloud. Now, that's just the number of crashes right there. That's not necessarily a full app crash. That could be something that happens in the background to throw a very serious stack trace, which is then caught by the app and then either dealt with or swallowed up or however it's handled. But it basically means something bad happened, something unexpected happened. Here's the crazy thing. Out of all of the apps that we have seen crash or throw an error that's critical, 17% of those test cases were reported as passing test cases. So this isn't to say that 17% of all test cases run on mobile apps have crashed with a, a problem and still been declared passed. This is saying that if Backtrace picked up or Sauce Labs analytics or error crash reporting, if it picked up uh, evidence of a crash or an error report thrown by a mobile app in our real device cloud, there's a 17% chance it was in a passing test. 36% means unknown, which means either that the status was not reported back to Sauce Labs or that it was actually, a, you know, it was a passing test or it just completed all of its instruction. There were no cases where uh, in, in this 36% where a crash happened and we, we verifiably got an error or a failed test result from, from the user. Keep in mind that when a Sauce test is considered passed, the test itself on, so Sauce Labs is, is over here, dutifully running tests on infrastructure. Your code is over here in, behind your firewall or doing whatever it is, where we're living wherever it is. It's sending instructions over to the Sauce Labs cloud. Sauce Labs is incapable of, the, of, of actually passing judgment on a test. If there's an error, we'll throw an error and we'll say your test is errored out. That's the 47% in the middle. But if you're doing an assertion, like uh, make sure that this button showed up or make sure that this text appeared. We don't actually, we see that you, you were looking for that, but we don't actually see that you were trying to exercise an opinion or pass judgment. 17% means that the conditions of the test, according to you, were passed and you sent us metadata that actually sent the signal that the test passed. There's no way Sauce Labs can mark a test as passed without the user declaring that it passed. So 17% of the tests that had some sort of crash or error were considered passing tests by the user. 
by the Sauce Labs tester, whether it's automated or manual. And we have a whole breakdown by, you know, who ran the test every day. I can't, I can't show that. I'm not going to show that. But if you're curious about, you know, how, how your tests are going, something like that, if you're a customer, I invite you to contact your customer success manager because it's kind of shocking when we ran this report, just how prolific it is that people are seeing crashes and errors they don't even know about. Now, how is that possible? There's a few ways it's possible. One of the ways is that, uh, you know, there's sub subsections of an app that can crash, but the main part of the app can still function. And so you're able to complete your test. Maybe a crash happened in the background and you, you didn't see it, you didn't know it happened, but uh, it, it still happened and you didn't notice it. So there's a, what we call a dark corner. And we haven't shed light on that dark corner in the past and no one else has either. So the other way an error, a test can pass uh, while while showing a crash is, and we have definitely seen this in our in our data, the test completes all of the instructions, and then at some point after we receive the pass signal, the app crashes and dies. Now that happens on occasion. It's uh, very much variable by user, by the person or, or the team running the, uh, the test, but it's something that happens shockingly often. Um, and so getting back to this slide, what we're trying to do is, is, is show you, instead of just seeing the top part of the iceberg, the entire array of problems that can happen during the execution of tests within the client, within the app, is now available to you when you run a test on Sauce Labs without having to instrument or do anything at all to show it. Here's an example. Here's a set of test cases. And you can see one is highlighted with app crash. That's a tag that we add to it when we detect one of these crashes happening anywhere inside the stack of the client. And here's the stack trace itself that we can actually show you what's going on. And it, it gets you, uh, it gets you line numbers. It gets you the actual part of the code that crashed. And this is unique in the industry. Nobody else has the ability to give you this superpower of information that covers the entire part of, of the, the top to bottom of what's happening inside the SDK, whether it be an internal hardware issue with you, where you're interacting with the hardware in a way that doesn't work, or it's incompatibility issue where you're interacting with part of the software or hardware that um, maybe is a, an older version of the operating system that maybe you don't test all the time. It also could be communication with a backend server uh, where there's an API or microservice that's been deployed badly, or even an uh, API that you don't, you didn't create, something like PayPal or eBay or whatever. Um, I don't know why I pulled those two examples out. So it, it could be wh whatever it is, if there's a stack trace that's happening that creates a severe error inside the, the device itself, inside the device logs as you operate a test, then it, it, it just surfaces it like magic in a way that we've never seen before in the industry when you're running it pre-production in that environment. And you can have a really, really good sense. I mean, this is shift left manifested in a way that you can feed these develop these reports back to your developers within moments of getting them. And this prevents those errors from going out into production, hitting your users and having to be uh, you you know your your MTTR instantly drops when you started feeding this data back to pre-production. We want to reduce time to detection. We want to prioritize errors that matter, and we want to resolve these things faster. I'll let you read the text on the slide, and we will send these out when we, once we're done. But the point is, we want to get this kind of error reporting into the testing lifecycle in a way that it hasn't been there before. This is observability. Observability that's been talked about lately is how many tests are you running? How many of them are failing? What happened during the test as far as the front end is, is able to, to be determined? What kinds of analytics are you able to see from the testing platform, not from the application itself, not from the full stack of everything you're trying to do inside your app? This is because Sauce Labs is trying to build a platform for tests that's unlike any other. Observability in the crash and error reporting space, it's unique to us. The ability to give you insights into the 6 billion tests that we've run and slice and dice those up by verticals and, and by uh, different ways we've we, we been able to do so, 
to be able to bring you benchmark reports and and things that that have uh, been representative of all the major enterprises that we that we service. Uh, being able to give you page load performance and failure analysis and and, uh, and mobile app diagnostics and telemetry within the app. It's a unique offering in the industry. This is built on top of the ability to do visual testing, mobile beta testing, low code automation. All these things are built into our application layer to be able to service the observability part of it, all of which is built on the world-class infrastructure within, uh, within the SOX Labs cloud. Going back to the software development lifecycle, we have a unique offering to show you today around how you can get all of, you can address every problem that we showed earlier, every issue that we've seen and bring people into our platform in a way that gives them telemetry and data that they haven't been able to get before, as well as the ability to run all of this stuff on thousands and thousands of different real devices all at the same time through mass parallelization and uh, cloud management. Once again, I'm not going to read these to you. I'll just leave them behind. And just want to leave with a cut with, with a, some some final thoughts before we uh, bring in uh, some some folks to help us with qu uh, questions. Um, we're trying to capture and prioritize, organize the, the data, and um, we want to give this to you. Uh, we want to give this to you in a way that we've never been able to before. Ah, I see Delia is on. Hello, how are you? Hopefully you're not having audio problems. Hi, Marcus, I hope not. Great, great. So I think we are just about ready to uh, move into Q&A. Uh, trying to remember if this is my last slide. Yeah, it's my last slide. So, um, so uh, can you help me just real quick, Delia, before we get into questions? Um, help me understand MTD, TD, and MTTR. Can you speak to this slide? Sorry, not to put you on the spot. Yeah, no problem. Um, right, so so mean time to detection mm -hmm. um, would mean we're lowering the average time it takes teams to be aware of any um, errors, exceptions, unhandled exceptions, crashes, et cetera, um, that are happening in their apps in certain scenarios. Um, so, so minimizing the, the mean time to detection um, is obviously helpful in, in lowering the um, time to ultimately resolve the reports. So mean time to detection gets lowered when using backtrace by first of all, being able to have any insight to the, the um, error or crash reports at all, um, as well as there, there are integrations with backtrace so that you can be notified in, in third party tools like um, issue trackers or chat tools to be uh, proactively notified when one of these situations occurs. Cool. Um, so, so we could prop, we could presumably then have a, have a situation where someone's running tests inside the real device cloud and we see a crash and we're able to sort of like send an, an issue over to Jira with the whole stack trace and the whole logs and some issue, some some indication of like where it happened and when it happened and how often it happened. Like kind of exactly. Right. And, and that's sort of um, also like, in the organization section there, the what deduplication means too. And this is all um, configurable with like how automatic JIRA integrations, for example, could work. Um, so the deduplication means that you also have insight into if it's the first time that this error actually happened or not. Um, so what Backtrace does every time it receives one of these reports is groups the reports into what we call fingerprints, um, which are error groups. Um, based mainly on the call stack. And there's even settings where you can configure how that works too. Um, but but the default ones generally work in most cases. Um, so in addition to knowing that an error happened, you can see the first time, like how, how many times that error has happened, that specific root cause. Um, you could see what version it was first introduced in or what version it was first captured in um, and, and, and things mm. like that. So instead of having just like a, a fire hose of data with you know detecting that, okay, all these errors and crashes are happening, um, you can detect groups of those errors based on you know the, the same root cause. 
It's great. I mean, it really, it really does sort of shorten the distance between you and root cause analysis. Root cause analysis is one of those things. Whenever I hear a vendor say that they've got it, I immediately dismiss them as okay, charlatans. Um, and I'm not representing that we have it, but this gathers information for you in a way that we, we at least haven't seen in the testing industry, the testing space. Right. Yeah. That that's the idea. So it, it's not um it's not actual root cause analysis, but what it is is um providing users with the information that they really need to actually perform that root cause analysis. Um, you know, we don't work through um other people's code or other companies' code and tell them how to fix the actual problem, but we listen to their feedback about the data they need to do so and, and make sure that that's visible in these reports. Um, and, yeah. and I think that yeah. that moves along to like the meantime to resolution. So the second half of this is about actually resolving those reports that you get. Um, so sort of separate from what what Marcus was diving into today, there is a, a another dashboard that you can view all these reports in where you're able to do a ton of querying and analysis, um, configure these integrations, as I mentioned, with like chat tools or issue tracking mm -hmm. tools. Um, and, and those all help teams um, have all the information that they could possibly need to ultimately resolve the, the crashes, errors, and so on. Yeah. What I like about this solution is that, it, you know, w when you upload your app to Sauce Labs, it's been done in a particular way. It's been signed in a particular way that, that allows us to do a little bit of injection of SDKs and stuff like that. And it's just, uh, it's great. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's. Usually you have to lift a lot of fingers to get this kind of data. And uh, I'm just really glad that you're yeah. able to give people this stuff without, without that. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So sort of what's described on this slide is um, the, the Sauce Labs um, error reporting on its own. But but there's almost, yeah, there's like a precursor here with the, the injection in RDC where it's, this is happening out of the box and um, there's no... Um, you know, messing around with including additional libraries or anything like that for, for the folks actually developing the apps. Thank you so, so much, Marcus and Dahlia, for a truly thought-provoking uh, overview of error reporting. Um, I wish we had longer, honestly, but I'm fully aware that we're nearly at time. I do have a couple of questions I'd love to get your perspective on. First of those being tools like batteries and automated testing, what role do they play in reducing the occurrence of software defects? And I'll put that to either one of you. I'll let Delia take it if, you, uh, if you're okay with that. <laughs> sure. Um, so sorry, what, what role do these tools take? Um, I mean, I, I would say it's like underlying uh, a requirement. I think these tools are absolutely necessary. Um, to do anything useful with crash and error data. Um, so I, I, I don't know what to say about the role other than I would consider it um, absolutely necessary. Without them, I think folks are um, aimlessly hearing user reports of issues or, or wondering why um, they're, they're having less usage from their users and things like that. Um, so yeah, I would just say they play a yeah. crucial role. I think to me, what I see is that the the data that we showed earlier about the, the tests that have passed, even though they've experienced crashes and errors, that means that there's unknowns happening inside your software right now. And you're shipping with that. You're, you're shipping to production with that kind of thing, that kind of chaos happening within your app. QA is under threat right now and always trying to figure out how to make themselves more more critical to the organization they want to catch these kinds of things and now we're we're opening up that that part so that people can people can see it as Delia said it's a crucial role that these tools play and we've not had access to this kind of data before so we're we're able to up level everybody's skills you know just just by using our platform and I guess my next question, kind of staying on the batteries theme, <clears throat> some of the insights and analysis that tools like batteries can give you, what are the actionable steps that teams can take to leverage that data to reduce the occurrence of software defects? 
Yeah. So, so what we see um, in, in back trace is, is folks will set up some cadence of a triage of the issues that were reported um, or, or of the errors and crashes that occurred, I should say. So, so at some regular cadence, folks, uh, they kind of assemble a team that is going to be, you know, the firefighters on these types of issues. Um, they review what crashes or errors are happening most frequently or are occurring to, you know, particular parts of their user base that they care about more, whether that's um, like they're on the latest version or they're paying customers or um, particular operating systems and things like that. So we we see folks um, after they get this data triage <laughs> using the data, um, kind of assign them out to, to teams that then use all the granular information that's included in the reports. Um, to ultimately fix them. Um, so, so also in the backtrace side of things, you could include attachments, you could include custom attributes, um, you could integrate your source control tool with backtrace too. Um, so basically folks then dive into, depending on the team, depending on the, the error or crash, um, one of those kind of areas and, and fix it. Um, and then they they retest and confirm that this error crash doesn't recur in future versions. So so high level, I think that's um, kind of what you do after you start to collect this data. Brilliant, thank you. I mean, I'd love I'd love to really go down this road a bit more. I'm fully aware that we've only got two minutes left. I want to see if I can get to this last question. Um, thank you, firstly, Michael, for your question. Exploratory and manual tests will never be too old for mobile apps. If Source has automated tools for these apps, will manual tests affect test results? And the second part to that question is, when do manual and when do Source Labs auto tests in mobile? So when to do manual and when to leverage Source automated tests? Yeah, the follow-up is actually a whole topic onto its own. I, I can't answer that in 60 seconds. I'm afraid. Um, Use manual testing when you need a human to make decisions about how an app works. Use automated tests when there's some really easy things you can check to make sure that sort of preserves functionality. Uh, that's a quick answer. That's the five second answer. Um, so it's interesting. We we do allow mobile, uh, manual and automated testing that both produce these crash reports. And in fact, a lot of the data that I showed earlier is from manual testing. So. I don't know what the ratio is of manual to automated tests that showed those false, those those bad uh, passing results, but it it uh, you know it's it's in there. It, we we uh, it, it'll affect test results if you're. It, it's going to be on how you send in the metadata, how it affects manual versus automated. You can set it up in such a way where they're either combined or they're separate. It's it's all in how you manage the the, the metadata that you send around builds and tests and test names and stuff like that. So. You can handle that however you want. We support any any methodology you want to use. Thank you, Marcus. I can't believe it, but we're at time already. Um, thank you so much, Marcus, for a thought-provoking session today. Truly, thank you for myself and everybody on the Source Labs team today for joining us. Um, we look forward to welcoming you to our next software testing summit. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.